Hey everyone, Ian from Tech Tech Potato. We're here at Computex and joining me, this is George from Chips and Cheese. You know Chips and Cheese, chipsandcheese.com, go check them out. Reason why I've got George on today is because he's read something that I haven't. Intel has launched a 64-bit only document. How do we describe it? Well, it's not really 64-bit only, so that's a... If you were to read just the sort of the notes and what the media have been saying, that's what you would sort of get the sense of. I mean, that's kind of what it sounded like. I mean, so so just for context, I've just, as we're filming this, I just posted my video about ARM going 64-bit only. So for Intel to have a similar sort of sounding document, you're saying that's not what it is? So not, so as far as the user, so the person using your computer or using the computer, there's basically no change. There's right. no user mode change here. There's 32-bit programs will still work. There is no change there. Where the change for the for the removal of 32 and 16-bit comes in is at the sort of lowest level of booting, right? Booting the computer. But isn't that where all my security is? Yes, it is, and that's partly why Intel is doing this. Is because now they're just booting straight into what's called long mode or just 64, 64 bit mode. Previously, they would have had to boot from 16 bit into 32 bit protected mode and then into 64 bit long mode. Who wants this? So this is mostly for the verification engineers, the people who are making sure that the CPU does what it's supposed to do, right? That's really who this is for. And it's also really, it's for design simplification purposes, right? When, when people talk about the technical debt of x86, a lot of actually what they're talking about is not the 32-bit ISA, because really for x86, there wasn't, there, there aren't huge changes between 32-bit mm -hmm. and 64-bit in terms of the actual instructions. This is the technical debt they're talking about. This sort of protected versus real mode and and. 8086 mode, which every single x86 CPU still boots as. It will still show to the BIOS as an 8086, even to this day. That is the technical debt that a lot of people are talking about when they're talking about x86 technical debt. Now, there are people who don't like this change, and that's the sort of homebrew OS bootloader people. Is that because they're used to how Intel's been for so many decades at this point? You know, they're going to have to redesign how they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, that's that's a lot of it. <laughs> they don't want to change. And it's like, yeah, I understand where you're coming from, but a lot of this sort of has been coming for years. And frankly, at this point, it's sort of stuff that I think should be done. Yeah, yeah. it's a kind of redefining that baseline. If you're booting straight into 64-bit mode, it just gets around that. But So you've read the document, and I specifically asked you on because I haven't. I've literally only seen kind of the, uh, the headlines in, in a few of the press. Um, it, was this a big document? It was 46 pages, which is not a huge document for something that's outlining this. Wait, okay, so this just sounds like an idea of a plan, not necessarily putting anything into, into written. So, no, this is beyond just sort of a plan of intent. So there is sort of the replacement for the current interrupt structure, which is what this is changing, is what's called FRED. That's the acronym for it. And FRED. Yes. F-R-E-D. Yes, FRED. Does that stand for...? Functional. I, I don't remember what it says. Okay, for. so 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 this is this is getting rid of Fred. No, this is introducing Fred. Okay. As, and x86 S is essentially f the Fred only version of x86. Okay. Removing all the old I/O ring. So in x86, there's I/O ring zero, one, two, and three. They're getting rid of I/O rings one and two completely getting rid of 32-bit ring zero, and they're getting rid of all the protected modes for 16 and 32-bit, along with 16-bit addressing. Completely gone. So no, nobody really used ring one or two anyway. 
as far not, as I understand. Not you, the user. Drivers did, though. And so this is a security precaution so that, say, a driver's misbehaving. Well, if you have, say, a, like a bad driver that's designed to do something bad, it can then escalate from ring zero to ring to, to your kernel ring, which is, if I remember correctly, ring three. That's it. Your kernel is completely unobstructed and malware can just spread from right. there. So this is not just a verification. That's ring zero. Ring three is user. R yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. The other sorry. way around. Yeah, yeah. Other way around. But um, it's been a busy week. Uh, so. <laughs> we are at Computex. <laughs> uh, Computex. Computex. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so. One, and once you hit that ring zero, it's you're, you have yep. no security. So this is also for a security reason, right? But um, now a lot of people are like, well, where's the performance aspect coming in? Well, that isn't really a big thing here, except what all these changes may allow Intel to do is to add more page sizes. So like a 16K page which Apple has adopted and add sort of different page sizes instead of just continuing with the standard 4K page. So, so th th this is an architecture level change to help with uh, memory accessing, memory addressing. Mm -hmm. um, so so you, you can only need to do one larger read rather than four smaller reads. And as well as supporting five layer pages natively, not natively, but instead of needing a separate sort of instruction to do it. So if you look at the, if you go into Linux and you pull up LSCPU, you'll see on Genoa and Sapphire Rapids, you'll see what's called LA57, which is uh, the fifth level of paging. Well, not to go too deep into it, but this will allow just native support of that without needing that sort of... So it, it also simplifies uh, yeah. a few things, simplifies especially for the, the high end. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's, that's really what this is supposed to do. So you're saying it, it's a bit more than a letter of intent. This is, this is going to come in. What do we think the timeline could be for this? Because we all know that Intel uh, is Intel's document, but this also applies to AMD and everybody mm -hmm. else. They're already working in on you know, generation N plus three, N plus four internally. Could this be coming sooner than we think, or is this still something more like five, seven years out? So FRED, which is the replacement for this, can be run in conjunction with the old system. So, and FRED's documentation has been out for two to three years now. So AMD and Intel have had plenty of time to know that this is coming. So I suspect that we'll see sort of FRED-enabled CPUs with, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These are FRED CPUs. <laughs> yeah. Hey, add an eye there, they, they become fried CPUs, very uh, tasty. Oh dear, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's slather and batter and deep fry. Okay, so, so we, we're gonna be in an ecosystem where it's gonna be concurrent and uh, the, the, the older way of doing things will slowly be phased out um, you know, and hopefully it'll be, you know, full disclosure when this okay. is going to happen. So any, any homebrew kernel developers out there will have chance to uh, get to this point. But, but you're saying a lot of, yeah, the verification engineers, they, they're, they're going to end up loving this because it just makes their job a lot easier. Yeah, this is not about die size per se, but verification engineers and security, really. Well, I mean, uh, Intel especially is going through, uh, we need to cut costs across the board. And if getting rid of some of that technical debt in, in order to improving that validation, the time to market, um, this, this, this is another page of that story. Yeah, yeah. A, a very technical page of that story. <laughs> Well, it's been great having you on the channel, George. Thanks for giving your insight. And no doubt we'll have you on again. If you like George, go read his stuff over at chipsandcheese.com. You may even find his stuff at semianalysis.com now over with our good friend Dylan. But if you like what you uh, listen to and watch, then please leave a like, comment, subscribe, you know, all that jazz, whatever. You know, you know where it is. Let me know what you think. But thanks, George. Thanks, Ian.